The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 208. One day, I shall come back. That's it. I've been renewed. As when a Time Lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a Time Lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave hearty. Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position heroes. Wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. Allons-y! I am Scottish. I can complain about things. She'll be fine. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the seventh Doctor story called Silver Nemesis. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Folks, if you have not done so, we would really appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from, and write a review for the show. We haven't had uh, any reviews in a bit, and reviews really help get the show out in front of new audience, new listeners, and so we greatly appreciate that. The only way we get the show before new people is when you help us do that. Uh, so if you can do that and share the podcast with your Doctor Who loving friends, we, we really do appreciate it. I also want to mention another show that you might enjoy the, on the network that is part of the StarQuest network is American Catholic History. It's a great little show, once a week, about 15 to 20 minutes, and learn something very interesting about the American Catholic history, as the title says. And sometimes it's some, something you've heard about, and very often it's about a little-known story that you will love to hear about. So uh, give that a listen. It's at sqpn.com slash history. All right, so this week we're talking about the Silver Nemesis. This is, like I said, the seventh Doctor. This aired in 1988. This was a... I think the penultimate episode of that first Seventh Doctor season, I think. There's one uh, one story after this. There's one story after this, and this one is also the actual 25th anniversary story, right. which is why it's sil- It's the sil- 25th anniversary, and a wedding is the silver anniversary. Right. But this isn't a wedding, so it's a silver nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose in, in some marriages it would be the nemesis. <laughs> yeah. A nemesis— is uh, even though it has a modern meaning of like arch enemy, mm-hmm. it comes from Greek mythology where Nemesis mm-hmm. was a goddess who extracted retribution on people who had hubris or excessive pride. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that works. That fits better here, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In that sense. Of course, the, the, the Dalek story we talked about previously would have made a much better 25th anniversary special because it was a much better story, in my opinion. But. Hmm. Yeah, the Remembrance, I think it was. Remembrance, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Remembrance of the Daleks. I was going to point out, so that's like two stories ago for the Seventh Doctor, mm-hmm. and both stories have essentially the same premise. Now, this is a story that's over 25 years old, so spoiler warning, but <laughs> in Remembrance of the Daleks, the Doctor has this piece of Time Lord technology called the Hand of Omega which he uses to destroy the Daleks. I mean, he blows up Scaro. And there are these, you know, neo-Nazis in that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And in this episode, Silver Nemesis, he's got this advanced piece of Time Lord technology called the Silver Nemesis, mm-hmm. and he destroys the entire Cybermen race. And once again... There are neo Nazis, <laughs> so and actual like, Nazis as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is like I've seen this story and very recently. Well, right. it both 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 occurred in 1963, and well, this uh, is 1980. This is well, yeah, 1983. Or sorry, yeah, you're right. Or yeah, 88. 80, yeah. yeah, mentioned 63. Sorry, part yeah. of it mentioned 63. And there's uh, according according to the the, the wiki that. So the author supposedly was approached and said, it was asked, hey, do you have a good story that would make a 25th anniversary story? And he said, yeah, I do. But he lied and he came up with this one kind of on the fly. And that's why. Mm. I wonder where his inspiration came from. 
<laughs> I like this one. I thought it, I think yeah. it's fun overall. It it's mm-hmm. some nice Cart- Andrew Cartmel era s- silliness and less ideological than normal. It's more about fun and less about ideology. Mm-hmm. That's yep. true. So I enjoyed it overall. I did too. I liked it. Uh, I think the the kind of craziness of Lady Penfort. I mean, she was mm-hmm. bonkers throughout this whole thing, and just having yep. the the her the fish out of water. You know, the Elizabethan. I suppose that's Elizabethan era. Yeah. A little after. Yeah, in in the twentieth century, I, th- I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, there were some good elements in that, so um, so I I enjoyed it too. I think it was, and it was a nice three three part three episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not not much padding at all. Uh, I think, and the doctor was. He was um, the se- a lot of the seventh doctor kind of can't be, but underneath is this. He's yep. playing uh, playing chess on a whole nother level. Yeah, and that was a conscious choice for this episode because again, you know, they tried to bring in the who really is the doctor. You know, especially even talking about you know with, with Nemesis itself of you know it was Omega and Rassilon and something Somebody else is going else. on. Yeah. yeah, and and Ace even does go start to go there. She's asking, like, so who built this at one point? Who built the Nemesis stuff? Yep. And, and oh, Rassilon and uh, Omega and, and then he goes <laughs> off on another direction. Yeah, right. I was like, and something else <laughs> is going on, you know. Right. So we, we should probably lay out, it's like there's a couple of threads running through this. And it's interesting. I was reading, the, there's a transcript online of the script, and there are a couple of elements that are that are in the story as it was released on, I think, VC- videotape at one point, like the VCR videotape, mm-hmm. that aren't in the uh, uh, the version that's available now. And that, that happens. Mm. They cut scenes. But it sort of changes some things, and mm. you could actually tell in the final result. But uh, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. But uh, So we have, we start with this, the Nazis in South America, because the boys from Brazil, right? Uh, <laughs> in well, uh, 1988. Because that's where a lot of Nazis went. Well, yeah. Right, 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 right. Uh, and so in 1988, I wrote 98, yeah, I'm, I'm off by a decade. In 1988, uh, it's November 22nd, which is the day before the anniversary of the premiere of uh, of Doctor Who in 1963. Uh, so uh, you have uh, this, I love the, like, they, they really drive home the idea that this is, that these are Nazis. Like, you can't mistake it. There's a swastika, there's a Hitler on the wall, you know, painting. <laughs> They're, and they're playing the Ride of the Valkyries in the background. I mean, this is, Wagner is the is the last clue, right? So, um, well, and then you've got Anton, Anton Differing, who is like the Nazi actor. Yes, uh, he's been in everything. Yeah, uh, in movies, TV. Uh, so, and then we get this like guy on a computer, and it shows landing coordinates at Windsor in England. Okay, so Windsor Castle uh, is is going to be the setting, essentially around Windsor Castle. There's a town there. And that's when we switch to Windsor, England, 1638, where we have the aforementioned Lady Penfort with her henchman, Richard, and poison arrows, and a mathematician making calculations, and then a silver arrow, which is important. Oh, you, you need to mention then the Nazis have a silver bow. That's right. So, yep. so we, have, we have two of—we're going to have three main antagonists in this. Yes. The, the Nazis, who have the silver bow— the uh, Lady Painfort, who has the Silver Arrow, and then the Cybermen are going to come in from space, as is the Nemesis itself, which is what they're all fighting over. Right. The Nemesis is a, a silver statue that's encased in this... It's a spaceship that looks like a, a, a rock, like a, a, meteorite, mm-hmm. a meteorite or something. And it's coming in 1988. And so what we'll, we're going to find out is the Doctor launched it into space in 1638. Right, and so Lady Painfort is having her mathematician calculate its orbit, and he calculates mm-hmm. it's got a 25-year orbit, it's going to come near Earth every 25 years, and then it's going to land on Earth in 1988. Yes. And so Lady Painfort then, and they're a little subtle about this, but not too subtle, she's preparing a spell that will allow her and Richard to travel to 1988 and it requires human blood. So off camera, they kill the mathematician once his calculations are complete and yes. use his blood to create what's kind of a tornado-like, a visual effects tornado-like thing yes. that transports them to 1988. 
<laughs> I although, love that. Yeah. although that's not actually what it is, as we'll learn in a later story. Right. Mm. Uh, I, I do love the fact that uh, when the, her Lady Penfort's home in 1988 is now like a pub or like, an, you know, where people yeah, are sitting and dining yeah. and they, these people <laughs> just appear suddenly. There was, I saw a reference online somewhere, like, did the mathematician, mathematician take into account the 11-day calendar correction in September of 1752 when well, we switched to the Gregorian calendar? He was <laughs> yeah. apparently ahead of his time, even though England was not yet using the Gregorian calendar. He must have known that that's what all the cool astronomers were using now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. Uh, and again, it's that whole 25-year cycle, the, that reference to the anniversary, uh, so that that's a lot of fun. And and it's interesting. So what we've got is this reference, but we don't see this reference to the doctor's original encounter with Lady Penfort and this silver nemesis. We never actually see that whole thing that initiated him launching it into space on a bad trajectory that will eventually bring it back to Earth. Well, he also mentions that he initially was the one who launched it from Gallifrey. Yes. And it ended up in Earth, landing on Earth because he made a mistake there. So then he launches <laughs> it off of Earth. And makes a mistake there too. Well, he, is, he did. He did set an alarm to tell him when it was coming back, right, so that he right. could deal with it. But he doesn't remember initially what the alarm is for when it goes off. Uh, I hate <laughs> when I set a reminder and I don't tell myself what the reminder is for. And five hundred years later, I'm I don't know why why this alarm exists. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and so, by the way, as a kid, I always wanted that that fob watch that he's got, where it's like the Timex, you know, LC, you know, at the time, top of the line LCD, you know, yes. watch on the inside, but it's the fob watch on the outside. I always wanted yeah. that. I wish they had <laughs> actually made those. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Doctor and Ace are attending a jazz party, sort of a jazz lawn party, and yes. having a good time. But then the Doctor's alarm goes off, and they decide to go back to the TARDIS to figure out what's happening because. He knows Earth is in imminent danger of imminent destruction, but not really remembering why, because it's been <laughs> centuries since he set the alarm. Yeah, right. And they're attacked by gunmen. Yes. And the gunmen are wearing silver devices on their heads. The headphones. headphones. <laughs> yeah, headphones. <laughs> that apparently indicate they're under cyber control, sort of. Yeah. yeah. But still capable of betraying the Cybermen, as, or at least the Cybermen infer they're capable of betraying them later. So, I don't know, maybe not total control. But the Doctor and Ace get to the TARDIS, and they go to the vault in Windsor Castle. And this is where the Queen stores all of the stuff that she's given as gifts when she travels. Mm-hmm. Which is which is true. You have when you have dignitaries meet, they give each other mm-hmm. gifts. You know, okay, you know, like whenever you like read stories about uh, the uh, the president of some country visiting the pope, it'll yep. say the pope gave him the president this, and the president gave the pope that. And of course, the pope doesn't need all of this stuff, right? <laughs> and and neither does the queen when she gets gifts. So she's got a she's got a vault for it, and uh, and they get to go through that. They're looking for the silver arrow, mm-hmm. the silver bow. Oh, the silver bow! But yeah. it's been it's been it was stolen like a hundred or more years ago, and mm-hmm. so they don't know they don't know where it is. But we yeah. do have some fun with them, you know, knocking around what's supposed to be Windsor Castle. It's really not, but yeah. it's supposed to be. And at one point, the queen, not the real queen, walks in front of the doctor with her famous corgis, corgi dogs. Mm-hmm. And he he's like, oh, I know that person, but he can't remember who it is. And Ace is, has to tell him. Yeah, <laughs> without right. actually saying it. Well, I love yeah. that one of the, one of the things in, in the castle there is a, a fez. Yes. yes, and you wonder if it's the same Fez that the Eleventh Doctor <laughs> played with in the fiftieth uh, anniversary special, right? Mm. Well, that's an interesting aspect of it is that the Doctor, the you know, in the twenty fifth and the fiftieth has the Fez because Fezes are cool, apparently. Yep. Yeah, and the thing they read a plaque when he they find the empty case for the for the silver bow that says, you know, the legend is that if the case is not kept for the bow in the ca- if the bow isn't kept in the castle. The silver statue will return to destroy the world, which is mm-hmm. kind of what's happening. So, yeah. we're also told the doctor before they before they see the queen, they go back to 1638 again, right? Uh, or, or I forget he goes. They go back and forth to 1638 several times in this, uh, mm-hmm. but he goes with Ace. They find the dead mathematician, and he tells Ace 
that Lady Painford has built this statue of herself, the silver nemesis, from a silver medal that fell from the sky. And he says it's a living metal called validium that is mm-hmm. very destructive. Yeah, mm-hmm. So that's, that's an important aspect. Yep. He doesn't say where the validium came from, who is responsible for it. He kind of keeps that close at to the first. chest for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At first. Yeah. Um, I I like how one of the concepts they have with the Valedium is it's like transuranic elements in that in order to become active, it needs to reach a certain critical mass. Mm-hmm. And so the statue by itself does not have enough Valedium to become active. It needs to be coupled with the bow and the arrow. Mm-hmm. In order mm-hmm. to become active and achieve the mass necessary to energize it and get it get it fully mobile, right. and it doesn't quite fit, you know, the way real world physics works. But I like that they're incorporating this concept right. from real world physics, and it it kind of makes you know some makes enough sense that I can go with it. And so the the comet they they call it a comet it's not really a comet but the the the, the spacecraft well, carrying it's the, really a spaceship but yeah, yeah the spaceship comet. crashes next to a warehouse or hangar of some sort near Windsor uh, in 1988 and everyone converges on it first the Nazis show up and then the well first the police show up and they get killed mm-hmm. by the, the the something that comes out of the ground we never get an explanation for what this oh, is yeah we do it's cyber oh. cyber technology. Oh, okay, so the Cybermen yep. got something there ahead of them. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, the policemen are killed, then the Nazis show up, and then the Cybermen show up in a spaceship. The Doctor shows up somewhere, and Ace show up somewhere in here and they, steal they the up, silver bow. They show up, do, the Doctor and Ace show up before the Cybermen, because Ace mentions how the Cybermen saved her life, because the yes. Nazis were going to kill her. Right, 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 and right. And then doc, Doctor says, don't, don't be so quick to thank them. Yes, yeah, the, and the Nazis demand the... The, the the that the doctor hand over the arrow. Of course, he doesn't have it. Um, and then he they leave the bow on top of the the spacecraft to to start mm-hmm. activating the the statue. That's when the Cybermen attack. And in the in the uh, the Fufara, the doctor steals the bow without the Nazis noticing. And that's when Lady Penforce shows up and starts shooting gold tipped arrows at the Cybermen, which is the only thing that will kill them, not the bullets. But they're not ordinary gold-tipped arrows. They're poisoned gold-tipped arrows, and she right. thinks it's the poison that's killing the Cybermen, when in reality it's the gold. That's right. That's right. Yep. Uh, and, I also uh, like how when she's shooting down the Cybermen, her, so her henchman, Richard, is apparently has a reputation as a hardened criminal, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he's really not. He's he's a lot more squeamish. Like when when she wants to use the human blood to transport them through time, he's definitely squeamish about that. And she's like, "What kind of villain are you?" <laughs> <laughs> but he he's like loyal to her. And Richard, by the end of this, I actually would like to see Richard as a companion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he's got this character arc where he becomes progressively more good as early on in as Lady Painford is shooting the Cybermen with the arrows and they're going down, he is so nervous that he's like on his knees praying out loud, promising to help the <laughs> sick and return money to people yep. and things like that. And it's just a sign of where his heart is ultimately at. He's That's he's true. not the hardened criminal that he led Lady Painford to think. I think, so this is the last appearance of Cybermen in classic who which is you know understandable given that there's not much classic who left right. <laughs> at this point uh but the the this version of the cybermen i have to say they're at least understandable you can understand the dialogue yeah. <laughs> they've, they've <laughs> toned down the amount of modulation in the speech and that's a that's a good thing i think yeah i also like how in this the cybermen disagree with each other and yes. they and talk things out and change their plans in a reasonable way they are not unreasoning villains that just all march in lockstep. They actually They're not Borg. D- d- yeah, <laughs> right. they they thought. discuss things and they react accordingly as circumstances change around them, and that makes for a better villain. Yes, exactly. Uh, so let's see. It, it's the Cybermen take the Silver Nemesis statue. They 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 are victorious over the spacecraft. Everyone scatters. Um, and, and I, I like the scene of Painfort. And Richard walking through the town of the modern day town of Windsor in their mm-hmm. uh, post Elizabethan garb, yeah, dra- garb, 
uh, and get waylaid by these t- roughs, these these tough guys who are trying to mug them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And they, yeah. these guys end up hanging by their feet from a tree naked or uh, in their undergarments. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not just in their undergarments, but as they they as they're preparing to rough up Lady Painford and Richard, who for some reason they refer to as social workers. Yeah. yeah, they they're just starting to rough them up, and then we get a camera cut, and they're hanging from trees by their upside down by their feet. Yep. They've been tied up in trees with ropes, and their clothes except for their underwear, is on the ground in a pile set on fire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're they're not wearing those clothes again. This is like salting the earth, uh, it's sort of a, a re- revenge for them. Yeah. But not everything in the 20th century is as uh, Lady Painfort and Richard are not as prepared to face every danger in the 20th century as they are ruffians, because they then encounter a bear— and, and Richard is scared of the bear, and Lady Painfort says, the bear will not pursue us. Such things happen only in the theater, which <laughs> yeah. is the equivalent of only in the movies. Yeah. And then they encounter llamas. And, which are and completely Ri- alien to them. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and Richard is like, they will eat us. <laughs> and, and they're just munching on the grass, and yep. Lady Painfort is, they are passive, I think. Yes. So, but it's like, okay, look at their body design. They're clearly prey animal herbivores, but yes, yeah, it's still fun. Yeah, llamas are are kind of scary if you don't if you're not familiar with them. So I, I get well, that. they they will spit on you. <laughs> yes, yes, they will. So the doctor uh, first he explains to to Ace about the uh the, the validium was invented on Gallifrey as the ultimate defense. It's a weapon of mass destruction by Om- Omega and Rassilon and himself. And uh, so, uh, once again, and <laughs> well, he doesn't say this time. He dodges the question when Ace asks, "Is it you?" Also, yeah. Uh, then he uses the bow as a guide to bring him and Ace to where the Cybermen have the statue in this. It's called a folly. It's a, it looks like a, a a small castle or like a tower constructed mm-hmm. as a tomb. And the the, the cyber Lady leader Painford's tomb. Yes, yep. we find out uh, the cyber leader. Uh, at this point, says victory is inevitable and calls in reinforcements, which definitely means it's not inevitable. <laughs> <It's>... Yeah. <laughs> and so the doctor ends up jamming their transmission with, with smooth jazz, which I think is great. When you mentioned pa- uh, Lady Painfort and Richard, when they see the llamas, she also points out that at this moment, he is standing upon his own tomb, which bears yeah. his date of death, which has got to be a bit of a sobering realization that this is the day i know now know the day that i'm going to die which is well be interesting. if unless time can be rewritten but on the on the bright side for him it says that he died in the 51st year of his age and yes. to, yep. to to someone in 1638 that's like yay i get to live to be an old man <laughs> right. exactly <laughs> that's somewhat sobering for someone who's just turned 52 so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we see a sign that says that they're in a safari park. So the tomb is now part of a safari park near Windsor, apparently. And that wild animals we about. I- I'm disappointed that we don't see any more wild animals after this. Like, yeah. I'm not sure why this sign was there. And maybe there was something got a, a scene got deleted or something. But so in the tomb, the Cybermen have have left the tomb for some reason. And that's when Paintfort and Richard go in. And the statue is no longer there. Oh, they're, they're, the reason they go out is to lure Lady Painfort in. With so the that arrow. She'll, so that, with the arrow, so that she'll go mad when she sees uh, her tomb. Right. From right, the right. inside. Uh, her she, tomb She's already bears, mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Short trip. So the tomb bears the inscription, death is but a door, which is actually a message. It's a secret message that there is a hidden mm-hmm. door <laughs> in the tomb. So... Uh, they are they're they attack, but then they're driven back by the gold arrows. I do like this scene with so the Doctor and Ace are looking at the Cyberman spaceship being guarded by these two human cyber slaves, and he says to Ace at this point, uh, "Tell me that that you didn't ignore my instructions to make more a uh, Nitro Nine. Is it possible that uh, <laughs> that that this uh, would you be and would you have disobeyed further instructions and be carrying it with you?" And she says, "No, I uh, I would never do that." He says, "Good." Go blow up that ship, <laughs> yeah. which she does which, with well, glee. <laughs> well, I like that. Not just to say I will never do that. Was, I'm a good girl. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, this is just like a scene in Remembrance of the Daleks oh, where the doctor turns to Ace and says, give me some of that nitro nine you're not carrying. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. 
<laughs> I do I do love the fact that Ace is a bit of a, like a, a bit of a like, pyromaniac, not pyromaniac, whatever the the ver- the equivalent is for someone who likes to blow stuff up. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. just a, I love that little uh, personality aspect of her. She's actually a little like Sabine in the in Star Wars Rebels it, if you watch oh. that, so it's kind of fun. Okay. I, yeah. I like that she gets to actually blow up the cyber ship. That's that's yes. fun to see. There is yeah. that is nice. There's, there's, this is this is not a cyber ship in orbit. This is one that's just sitting there on mm-hmm. the grass in the forest, and she lobs nitro nine into it and blows it up. And it's yes, it blowed up real good. <laughs> it was yeah. a good explosion. <laughs> so uh, the the at this point is when the Nazis propose an alliance with the Cybermen who oh, agree. Uh, uh, this, yeah. this is hilarious. So there's only two Nazis now. All the rest of them have apparently been killed. Right. And they explain to the to the Cybermen, when the Cybermen say, well, why should we use you for anything? They say, well, we lack your vulnerability to gold. And so yes. it's like, mm. yeah, but not to poison arrows. Yeah. So, okay, someone waves a gold watch at you, you won't faint. But if they shoot a poison arrow at you, you're just as dead as a Cyberman. Right, right. Uh, And, of course, Nazis and Cybermen, they both immediately plan to betray each other. I mean, that's just (laughs) clearly what's going to happen. Uh, The Doctor then outlines the 25-year orbit of the Comet Nemesis, Mm -hmm. how it coincided with bad stuff on Earth every time it came back around. Uh, in 1913 was the eve of World War One, which not really, <laughs> kind of ish. It had we had to fit the 25 year cycle to include 1963 because of Doctor Who. 1913. But, yeah, so 1913, the 1938 Hitler invades Austria, 1963 the assassination of J- JFK and the start of Doctor Who, and then 1988. So and, well, uh, and you must... all all those work except for sixty three. The Kennedy assassination is not really a world. I mean, it was bad for America and it was a bad thing. Yeah, but the killing of one man, however however important he was on the world stage, is not equivalent to World War One or World War Two. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, but the doctor must have put it on a thirty two year year orbit now because you know from nineteen eighty eight to twenty twenty. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Another really bad year. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is when, let's see, um, d- when the Nazis attack Painfort and Richard, uh, Richard throws in the towel. He just grabs her, tosses the arrow at the statue, and runs. Like, he's like, this is it. I'm going to save you, save my lady and run. And she's kind of mad because, of course, she, she's crazy and wants to save the, th- the, the statue for herself. Um, the Nazis now think that we've got everything. We've got the statue, the arrow, the bow, and they've got this case that they haven't looked in that they think the bow is in, which it's not. The doctor has the bow uh, at this point. And this is, we, this is about where the, the uh, deletions are for the Nazis and the mm. Cybermen. There's a, mm-hmm. a moment where, the, where, where we don't see that. They don't show this now, but the, the Cybermen actually take the head Nazi Flores, which is not a very German name, and uh, the flowers, his, yeah, yeah, and and mm. Carl, his henchman, they take them, and uh, Carl apparently betrays Herr Flores, hmm. but it turns out he didn't. Later, there's a whole like subplot here of them being cyber slaves and then not cyber slaves. Yeah, that would explain because th- I noticed in one of these scenes that all of a sudden Flores is wearing the cyber he- headphones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and but he's still talking like he's not under their control right and later he's clearly not under their control so i wondered wondered what was up with that it felt like something had been cut well he even references how they they thought they controlled him but they didn't realize they were dealing with a superior mind you know typical nazi propaganda type stuff Mm. (laughs) yes yes the superman and the ubermensch uh so the uh the, the doctor finds out that there's a a uh, cyber fleet in orbit. It's waiting for the signal to come down and take over, as usual. And um, there are thousands of ships, and we're told it's the entire cyber race. Yes. And they are going, so the whole race is at stake, just like the whole Dalek race was at stake two episodes mm-hmm. ago. Right. They're, they're going to turn Earth into new Mondas. Yes. Uh, and the doctor says, okay, the best move here is to go in unarmed and with the bow, <laughs> which which is, you know, it seems counterintuitive. Ace, I like this this moment here where Ace tells the doctor that she's more scared than she's ever been. And he apologizes to her and says, you know, okay, I'm sorry, you can go back to the TARDIS and just wait. It's safe there. And you can just wait until, 
you know, everything's over and I'll come back for you. You know, and she and at this point she says, no chance. I'm not I'm not throwing in the towel on this. I'm, I'm going with you. But I do yeah. like this moment where he he doesn't mock her. He doesn't run her down for 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 being afraid. He says, I'm sorry. Like, I, I only want you to come with me if you're up for this. So if you're not up for it, I mm-hmm. mean, uh, go ahead and wait it out. Uh, so I do mm-hmm. like that moment. It's also part of him testing her for her ultimate journey. Part of what he's doing with her, at least this was the plan, but the cancellation of the show thwarted it. Mm. He's preparing her to become a time lady. Oh, interesting. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. He also knows a secret about her that even she doesn't know that won't get paid off for a while. But okay. you know how it was a time storm that brought her to the doctor? Right. And it was a time storm that brought Lady Painford and Richard to the 20th century. Okay. Mm-hmm. Those two things are connected. Interesting, interesting. But but we don't get to see the, the payoff no, on that? No, we do get to see the payoff on that. Oh, okay. Right. The, the, the that's It's coming up, you know, in the next season. Okay. But the Doctor is also, and this is implicit in this episode, they don't bring it out, but one of the things the Doctor sees in 1638 is a chessboard. Yes. That, and he comments initially when he sees it, oh, this game isn't going well. And he then, later on in this story, he plays chess with himself. Mm -hmm. He plays Mm -hmm. both the black and the white roles and defeats himself, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. But then, as he and Ace go into the tomb to, as part of their confusing assault, they're like tossing the bow back and forth to each other, playing keep away with the Cybermen and spouting chess terms. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not obvious from this episode, but the doctor is playing chess with himself across time to prepare for the foe that he, whose hand he recognizes in these events. Oh. Uh, Lady Painfort and Ace, both having gone through time storms, are both unwittingly influenced by a foe he's preparing to face. Oh. And and that foe will be eventually be revealed and they they continue it into the future in Big Finish with mm. the the further dealings of this foe with Ace and so forth and chess and all of this stuff. Okay. Ooh, that's that's something to look forward to. I think I I've, yeah. I've heard you guys reference some of this stuff with Ace in the past. Uh so that's coming up so uh, I'll look. Right. I'll look and, forward to that. And we, we've we've talked about the Cartmill Master Plan and things like that, where it there right. was this whole art overarching story that got cut way short. Yeah, but yeah. eventually played out in the books, and and also in New Who with the Timeless Child because it kind of borrowed mm-hmm. some of that. Yeah, right, reworked right. it. And and that that must be part of when they were back in 1638 again, when Ace was asking him these questions that the Doctor wasn't answering. Who will steal the calculations? Who will steal the bow? Who will brought Validium to the to Earth? All that sort of stuff that doesn't get answered in this is must be that future uh, re- revelations that are coming. Yeah, and there's another real big nod at it at the end of this episode in okay. the final confrontation with Lady Painford. Okay, because back in 1980, the Doctor goes to the to the warehouse. Well, first he uses the bow to lure the Silver Nemesis out of right. the tomb into the TARDIS. We don't actually see it in the TARDIS, but he gets it back to that warehouse where the spaceship is. And Yeah. And the statue now has enough agency from being in the proximity of the bow and the arrow that it has limited mobility, but and it mm-hmm. will now follow the bow as a result to try to reunite itself. Right. Right. Now, Lady Painfort and Richard are trying to get around and they're they learn how to hitchhike. <laughs> Watch a guy hitchhike yeah. <laughs> and get picked up by a rich American Southern lady in a limo. Oh, this this is awesome! I love this <laughs> sequence. So you've got uh, Richard and the and there's a chauffeur that we never see, but right. yep. you've got the rich American Southern lady and Lady Painfort and Richard all in the back of this limousine, and they're they're trying to ingratiate themselves. To her, or at least Richard mm-hmm. is, because he's trying. They're trying to get this lift. You know, they're trying to be nice, right? And she's got this strange accent, and she's clearly rich. Yeah, but she—I mean, to them, strange accent. 
Right. And uh, they ask if she's local, and she says, oh, no, I'm here checking out my roots. Yeah. And <laughs> and since since this is, since the book Roots has not been written in 1638, Richard mm. does his best to respond to that by saying, "'Tis wise with crops this time of year, ma'am." <laughs> 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 Mean, meanwhile, Lady Painfort is more out of it than normal and just conversationally says to the Southern woman, all things will soon be mine. <laughs> yeah. well, and then she figures out that she's the descendant of this, oh, yeah. of this enemy of hers in 1638 who she uh, killed for, for, for taking away her, uh, her or, like luring away her chef or her cook, her husband yeah. cook or something. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very... Uh, uh, nefarious, very dark. Yeah, she was well, the this, enemy this, of the Remingtons of Remington I, Grange. Yeah, yes. she the, this this Southerner who was supposedly from Virginia, although I don't know if that was quite a Virginia accent or not. But yeah, she thinks that the lady and Richard know her family tree, and it's like, no, they know your family, family. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. From back then. <laughs> so the actress is an American actress named Dolores Gray, who like this was her. First and la first role since 1961. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure like how she got this. It was also her last role that she ever did uh, after she that. She was but... probably living in England at the time or something, and they yeah. decided to have an actual American for once. <laughs> exactly. And and her accent is not Tidewater Virginia. It's it's more southern than that. But she yeah. could be an Im she could be an immigrant from farther yeah. south. Not hmm. not a, she's not a native uh, southerner. She's born in Chicago, lived in New York, so. Uh, but she did, she did okay, better than most yeah. uh, American accents on Dark Two. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so they get the nemesis to the warehouse. Then the Cybermen uh, show up. Ace has to fight back with her slingshot and gold coins, which is yeah. uh, nice. Uh, that, that's a good nice thing. She gets cornered up on a catwalk and uh, <laughs> outmaneuvered by this the little uh, she, Boston accent. There, a catwalk, a catwalk. Yeah, no, <laughs> it comes it comes out every once in a while. Gotta gotta be careful of that. Uh, she gets cornered on the catwalk. Uh, she outmaneuvers the cyber leader and gets them to kill each other in a crossfire. It was a little, nice little move there she I, had. This is so great because she's mm -hmm. surrounded by three Cybermen. She's got one coin left. There's a Cyberman ahead of her, a Cyberman behind her on the catwalk, and a Cyberman on a neighboring catwalk. And her solution is to shoot the Cyberman on the neighboring catwalk with the gold coin and then yep. duck so that the, two, the ones uh, uh, in front of her and behind her shoot each other. Yes. So with one gold coin, she takes out three Cybermen. It is so awesome. <laughs> is Almost ace. takes out three Cybermen. Yes. Yeah, yes. one of them lives. One of, of them course. falls falls, but lives long enough. Uh, meanwhile, the Doctor is reprogramming Nemes the Nemesis ship for a course to take it to the Cyber Fleet. And mm -hmm. uh, it it talks to him. The, the yeah. statue talks to him. It asks him if he will need her in the future. He says he hopes not. She says, you have said that before. Uh, and then she asks if she will have her freedom after, and he says, not yet. So, very interesting. And this is a very, you know, this is yeah. the, a dark, the dark side of the eighth, of the seventh, sorry, the seventh Doctor kind of peeking yep. through again, this, this element. Yeah, he also indicates that the reason Nemesis can't have its freedom yet is because things are still imperfect. Right, mm -hmm. right. And it's like, what does that mean? What is what is your perfection agenda here, Doctor? <laughs> that's yeah. right, that's right. So, uh, let's see, he destroys the last two Cybermen, they think, and then the, 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 the Nazis show up, they with, gloat. With, with the rocket sled. With, yes, yeah, that's mm -hmm. right, that's right. Which they is walk, what the comet really is. Yeah, they right. walk in front of the, the engines as they fire. Uh, they gloat and get, get killed by the cyber leader who's not really dead yet, and... Uh, and this is when Painfort and Richard finally show up, Lady Painfort and Richard. Mm -hmm. And this is where Lady Painfort indicates that she knows much more about the Doctor. This is, this is the big nod to the Cartmel Master Plan. She mm -hmm. says that the statue in the past has told her the Doctor's secrets. Uh, it's, it's, it's told her about Gallifrey, about him— about Gallifrey and the old time, the time of chaos, and implies that he has this role back then. Mm -hmm. And when one of the Cybermen is like, "We don't care. He's just a Time Lord," she's like shaking her head, going, "No, he's not yeah. just. A, he's not just another Time Lord." Right, right. 
Uh, and he, but he says he doesn't care what she if she blabs or, or not. He's like he yeah. just kind of throws it off. Uh, and then he surrenders the bow to the cyber leader, who orders Nemesis to be sent to the cyber fleet, which is exactly what the doctor intends to do. Because yep. the cyber leader doesn't understand that he's not going to be in control of Nemesis. Oh, Davros, don't use that hand of Omega. It's, yeah, oh, exactly. oh, no, the Nemesis is being sent up to the cyber fleet. <laughs> so the doctor once again maneuvers his enemy to do, into wanting to do exactly what he wants them to do. Uh, but fi- Lady Painfort can't bear to be without Nemesis, so she jumps on the statue and merges with it somehow. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, yes, she is and absorbed par- and into effectively it. dies. Yes, yep. the, the Nemesis becomes the absorber law. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then once it it launches, and once it gets there, it destroys the cyber fleet. So it's mm-hmm. and so now there's just the cyber leader left. He's going to kill the Doctor, but Richard jumps in. And he's got this arrow that had hit the TARDIS's door and has stuck in it mm-hmm. ever since that first battle at the warehouse. He grabs that and then jumps on the, the cyber leader and jams it into the into the cyber leader's chest plate and kills it. So all the Cybermen in all of creation are, are dead, right? Nope. Yeah. So <laughs> yep. never. Uh, they give him a lift back to 1638. And see, this is where I find myself thinking. Richard's character arc over all of this is like he 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 saves the Doctor at the end. He kills the last Cyberman. He's a good guy at this point. Yeah, he, I would enjoy seeing him as a companion. He could be like the new Jamie, the you know the man mm-hmm. from the past who's he he would be different than Jamie. Yeah, Jamie had a tendency to just roll with anything. Yes, right? and R- Richard is more timid than Jamie. But I I think it would be fun to have him as a companion. He's basically moved into that role by the end of the by the end of this story. It would be interesting to see how Big Finish have a a future doctor or a different doctor. Doesn't have to be a future doctor. Even well, it'd have to be. I suppose. It, it, no, 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 no. It could even be Sylvester McCoy. He's still recording right. plays yeah. for them. That's true. Yeah. That's true. They could they could have a uh, but they could have a different doctor even. Go back and pick him up and have adventures before his fifty first birthday or fifty first. Or, day or to death. they could sh- they could show us adventures with him and the doc the seventh doctor and Ace oh, in yeah. that trip back to sixteen thirty eight that we don't actually right. see on camera. That's true. That's true. Uh, so then Ace at in once they're back in sixteen thirty eight realizes that the whole thing was set up by the doctor. The doctor launched Nemesis in sixteen thirty eight. Clear in a, in a uh, outright attempt. There was no mistake in in his calculations. In fact, he he intended to draw in the Cybermen to destroy them completely with using Nemesis as bait in 1988. So this was a whole like this was not a oh I made a mistake I launched it in such a way that it was going to come back to Earth. No, he did this on purpose. And so yep. the the Doctor's like Machiavellian machinations within you know <laughs> circles within circles here uh, mm-hmm. that we get to see. So very they- interesting. They also hang a lantern on the fact we just did the same thing to the Daleks when Ace yes. points that that out, and um and we have closure uh, musically, even though soft soft jazz or smooth jazz doesn't exist in 1638. They play early <laughs> modern. R- Richard turns out as a musician, and he brings in mm-hmm. another woman who's a musician, and they play early modern music. Yeah, that's right. To uh, the doctor and Ace, and Ace is like, "Okay, so doctor, now tell me who you are." And he's like, "Shh," and right. listen to the music. <laughs> yes, yes, that's uh, <laughs> that, and that's where we end it. So, uh, final thoughts on this on this episode, uh, Father Corey. I enjoyed the episode. It's just you know, I thought the revelation of the Daleks was was a better one. Mm-hmm. One thing I got a kick out of was. I think Ford Motor Company sponsored this because I didn't see the cop cars, but every other vehicle you see in here is either <laughs> a Ford van, a Ford car, or the 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 caddy is a Lincoln Cadillac or Lincoln, right. a, Lincoln the limo. a limo. So Ford must have sponsored this uh, <laughs> this particular episode. That's true, Jimmy. I enjoyed it. I I I agree that uh, Remembrance of the Daleks is more serious. It has a much graver tone than this does. But I like the fact that even though it's the same essential plot, I like that it's just fun. Mm-hmm. You know, there's lots of silliness. There's lots of little thing. It doesn't have to be deep. It, it's just fun. So a uh, couple of background notes. Nicholas Courtney, the, the uh, brigadier, yep. was a yeah. background in the large crowd that's seen at Windsor Castle 
which as is a nice. tourist. As yep. a tourist. As, uh, as, as I think uh, Elizabeth Sladen was, maybe. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't see be, that in the notes, but could that's be possible. Wrong. It says Anthony Ainley was asked to be one of the tourists. It doesn't say whether he actually ended up doing it. Um, there was I was I had seen something about the location shooting, but I'm not sure. Like they they I think they that was actually Windsor Castle that they were when they showed the castle. Was it? Uh, uh, no, but it's a stand-in. Okay, I mean it's yeah, it, it's something else. They okay. tried to get Windsor Castle and didn't oh, get permission. Arundel They're, Castle. That's what it was. Arundel uh, Castle. Um, yeah, and they actually tried to get the, some of the royals involved. I think like Prince Edward or somebody was asked to be, in, you know, in <laughs> involved yeah. as well, and they, they didn't really go for it, which would have been fun in the twenty fifth. It's the only, by, by the way, the only anniversary special with just one doctor. So that's mm-hmm. a little, mm. little bit of trivia there too. All right, I think that should about do it. Then uh, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Kenny E, James N. Eric B., Mary N., and Jason M., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us every week. So that's it from us. What do you think of the seventh Doctor story, The Silver Nemesis? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or send an email to Who at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be, I think, well, let me just double-check our schedule. We have a bit of an uncertainty here. Next time should be the 13th Doctor Christmas or New Year special, depending on how it works out, A Revolution <laughs> of the Daleks. We record these a bit in advance, and we still don't know what the schedule is. Uh, but a- apart from that, they we'll... haven't told us not because we haven't tried looking it up. <laughs> exactly, right. exactly. I've been I've been reading the tea leaves. I've been sending the TARDIS messages into the future. Nobody's been getting back to me. But uh, so it'll either be the Revolution of the Daleks Thirteenth Doctor Holiday Special, or uh, it will be the Sword of Orion, perhaps, which is an Eighth Doctor Big Finish story. So, uh, def- if you haven't got that and listened to it yet, uh, definitely go ahead and get that and uh, those. Those have been on sale. It might still be on sale for like a a couple bucks, so it's a nice deal. So check those out. Anyway, in the meantime, until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, Professor, Doctor, who are you? Right. This is going to be fun. (laughs) 